So let's go ahead and start. This is the uh, generalizing the concept of uh, essential variables uh, to other spheres under the geo umbrella. Uh, we have a program uh, for you consisting on the following list uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, sessions. Uh, lessons learned from the geo essentials will start uh, the discussion with a general view, and then we will focus on uh, biodiversity and geodiversity if you want. We will focus on agriculture, we will focus on water, we will focus on health, and then we will open a little bit the view uh, to, the, to the whole set of uh, sustainable development goals and uh, the use of essential variables as uh, as an enabler of the platform to the sustainable development goals. This should last only 30 minutes, so it should be very agile. And after that, we will reserve half an hour discussion. So I'm Jan Mazo from uh, CREAF. This is my only opportunity to present myself. And uh, now I'm introducing <laughs> Anthony Lehmann that you, you all know. Uh, he To say something, he is the lead of a group that we call ourselves Geoessential. It's part of uh, one of the four projects uh, in Era Planet, and we had this this focus on on essential on essential variables. And uh, Anthony will tell us lessons. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe we should also introduce Simon Eggleston, who is also uh, co-chairing uh, the session as far as I, 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 agreed. I know. And, uh, and we, we agreed, will, so... <laughs> we will introduce him because he yeah. is going to lead the discussion. I ah, excellent. So perfect. that's so, how we split it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, without waiting, wasting more time, so yes, uh, my name is Anthony Lehmann. I'm a coordinator at the moment of this geoessential uh, project, which is uh, uh, 14 partners in seven European countries. And we've been working uh, for four years now and, and trying to push forward the idea of uh, geoessential. One of our, uh, because it's lesson learned from the project as we are getting to the end, uh, you probably, as you're interested, looked into the special issue that we could uh, prepare. Uh, in the International Journal of Digital Earth, uh, where we had a set of uh, um, uh, papers that uh, most of them came out of uh, the Geoessential uh, uh, project, exploring essential variables in different fields and also trying to push forward the idea of workflows uh, that would allow us to move from data to uh, final indicators. So next slides, please. Last year, we had already a discussion here, and we can still uh, look at the, the, um, the, the video of these uh, on essential variables, where I presented already some of the, the work done in Geoessential, the framework that we have pushing forward essential variables across societal benefit areas, where we looked at how uh, essential variables um, uh, could define the entire global socio-ecological system which criteria we should use to, uh, um, to select essential variables, how essential variables can be related to the driver pressure state impact response um, uh, indicator systems, and how we, uh, we uh, propose a, a way to implement workflows using essential variable within this uh, virtual lab. Uh, and then examples of these workflow on land degradation, on nexus approach, on extractive, on urban areas, and, and linking also and looking at gaps of essential variables for addressing the, the SDGs. So that was kind of last year. Next slide. This year, we uh, are working now on a paper to try to get a, a newer vision of where we stand in uh, the different kind of area of, of interest of geo. Of course, describing the Earth system, you have atmosphere, biosphere, geosphere, hydrosphere, where in most of these fields now, and we discovered, in fact, the geodiversity uh, um, uh, essential variables. Uh, uh, this, this is almost covered now, where in the kind of more socio-economical part of the socio-ecological system, there is still much work, and especially on infrastructure and on health. You know, there's a lot of work being done on health, but I don't know, I don't think, people are, are using the terminology of essential health variables. But if we could, we'll see at the end and push forward and that's our aim, the development of essential variable in these um, 
systems, we have a way to address and bring uh, useful data to the entire social ecological system. Next. So I'm just now going to focus on some outputs of our recent outputs of the, the project where here we have a, the paper that has been submitted uh, where exploring which essential variables we need to define to, um, to uh, describe so-called ecological infrastructures where in Europe, at least in Switzerland, in my Geneva town, uh, they are interested in defining this ecological infrastructure to set priority what needs to be preserved on the landscape and priority and using uh, essential climate variable, biodiversity and water agriculture set of essential variable needed to do this kind of policy um, planification. Next. Uh, I think you jumped one or no? Uh, yeah, you jumped one, sorry. Yeah, uh, another uh, paper that came out of our project is this one, uh, exploring the benefit of uh, new uh, remote sensing produce, uh, products uh, from uh, Copernicus to uh, help in the description of, of uh, essential biodiversity variables and compare them with existing uh, presently used uh, uh, um, uh, indicators um, that, um, that we have and also how these uh, data can be used to then model uh, the, 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 these essential variables with global vegetation models. Next. And another paper was exploring uh, um, essential climate variable on the terrestrial path and how uh, we, can, uh, we should be uh, using um, methods to, to uh, to uh, assess the quality and uncertainty of these different variables. So here we have on uh, a different uh, so-called essential climate variable, LAI, uh, NDVI-ET and so on. And there the proposition to, to assess them in different dimension uh, was made. Next. And here a very recent paper linking essential variables to the Swiss data cube by my colleague Gregory Giuliani, who uh, looked uh, how the Swiss data cube, which is archive of all the remote sensing available data across Switzerland, uh, can help define uh, the, the, these different set of uh, essential climate, biodiversity, and, and water uh, variables. And then, uh, Typically, if we are here today, it's because uh, we, we have been proposing uh, just a click here, a uh, uh, community activity within GEO, if you could, John, John, just click once. Yeah, GEO Essential Variable, GEO EV uh, activity, where we would like to uh, have a kind of meta coordination of the development of EVs across SBAs, so if we can still use this term, and uh, do a gap analysis, what is missing and uh, come up with a convergence of definition uh, maybe in the future in order to better be able to address really fully the, the full socio-ecological system and, and related SDGs. So, the next. So uh, in a paper that uh, we, are, we have submitted, we tried to list this kind of priority area and main topics of GEO and who is doing what on, on which uh, set of essential variable and uh, defining gaps again on health and infrastructure, for instance, but trying to, to, to get a, a new vision of where we stand. Next. And uh, to, to finalize in this paper, this is pretty much our understanding where we are at the moment with the different set of essential variable being developed at different levels of, of uh, development. But ideally, we would like to have all of them uh, finalized and available uh, so that we could uh, better uh, address the, the policy priority of GEO plus others at different scales uh, um, uh, with uh, such a system. Next, and I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, next, next uh, presentation. Uh, most more close on one, one single topic, biodiversity in this case. Francisco Scrot, uh, he is a um, macroecologist and tropical biochemist <laughs> by training. 
but he is excited by new opportunities of new data, like remote sensing, and new analysis techniques like machine learning. And uh, recently, he is more interested in the dynamic interactions between the bio geographical and biochemical characteristics of our environments. So, Francesca, when ready. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to present to you um, essential geodiversity variables and particularly the progress and challenges we've encountered so far. Next slide, please. So just very briefly, um, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with um, some of the more prominent essential variables, the essential climate, biodiversity, and ocean variables. Uh, next slide, please. And more recently, we've developed the essential geodiversity variables to fill a gap that we have uh, found quite obviously here to cover some of the aspects of the earth surface and subsurface. Next, please. So um, EGVs, very briefly, are abiotic or non-living variables, um, which are related to key surface and subsurface state and processes, especially those related to geology, geomorphology, soil, and hydrology. And like um, all other essential variables, we wanted them to be relevant to natural resource management, human well-being, conservation, um, and or ecology, but also to be complementary to and not duplicating other suits of essential variables. Um, then we also want them to be uh, feasible and cost-effective to measure. Next, please. So some uh, examples here, um, for example, if you look at um, geomorphology, that's related to landform distributions. And um, some essential variables could be landforms and their spatial distributions. I give a few more examples later on. And they are then important um, for a lot of ecosystem functions and um, SDGs as well, including um, has those related to hazard, um, conservation, flood regulation, and so on. Next, please. So how do we measure EGVs? Um, like most other essential variables, we can either use uh, remote sensing approaches or in situ approaches. Next, please. So for the remote sensing approaches, they are both uh, close range and air or space bone um, methods, which are appropriate. Um, and they can be used to measure all kinds of different aspects, including biogeochemical or optical uh, features, uh, physical, morphological characteristics, and so on, which are then used to discriminate according to um, geotypes, uh, geocores, georegions, and so on. And um, they all provide information about characteristics of, um, of the um, environment according to the EGVs, such as the composition, configuration, abundance, um, and so on of different geo features. Next, please. Unfortunately, in situ approaches in our case are very difficult to access at global scales, largely because a lot of those um, geo variables are very important for resource management and extraction, including mining. And so of course they are not available in open access databases. Um, we are currently working on, um, on a rapid geodiversity assessment protocol so that we can hopefully get a bit more in situ geodiversity data globally. And we are um, developing that together with colleagues at the University of Ulu. Um, so um, what we can do is already measure a lot of EGVs with remote sensing um, at a different range in, um, of resolutions and extent. So for example, in the last year, we published a paper on remote sensing of geomorphology, and there are a lot of examples there and, um, and um, an analysis of the kind of data that is, um, is accessible to us now and in the near future. Next, please. And then equally uh, with regards to remote sensing of soil features and characteristics, um, we published that in 2019. And again, there is a, a vast range of soil characteristics that we can already nowadays access remotely, including um, geochemical and geophysical features, but also structural, taxonomic and functional features of soil. Next, please. So what are the challenges um, that we've encountered? Um, there are, of course, a lot. Um, 
we are still at the, at the beginning of our journey. Uh, so one of them is just the lack of consensus on even defining geodiversity. Um, this has been used uh, in many different ways. There are some quotes here from different um, articles on geodiversity. As you can see, some of them are just um, a bit more um, constrained, just related to soil and topography. Um, others just cover all kinds of earth surface materials. Um, others include also the atmosphere. We have adopted a, um, the uh, quote you can see at the very bottom, so the variety of abiotic features and processes of the land surface and subsurface. So we exclude the atmosphere here, but keep it a bit broader than just soil and topography. Then another um, challenge is the lack of research on which geodiversity measures are actually essential in the terms of um, essential variables, especially with regards to the relevance of those different um, aspects for biodiversity and um, sustainability and so on. And again, there are many groups working on resolving that at the moment. Next, please. And then also with regards to measuring EGVs, um, it's very difficult to access lack and legacy effects because we have a, a acute lack of long-term temporal data. A lot of this remote sensing data I mentioned is relatively um, recent. So we can't really um, infer a lot about the, the lack and legacy effects and whether that's important to measure or not. Um, then there's also, as I said, a lack of access to especially harmonized in situ data. As I said, we, we work on a protocol to help with that at the moment. Next, please. And then finally, also a lack of research on optimizing remote sensing techniques for the assessment of geodiversity dynamics specifically. Um, so there are a lot of constraints, of course, also with um, the opportunities offered by remote sensing. Um, and a lot of the instruments were not specifically developed to assess geodiversity. So um, there's a lot of tweaking that has to be done um, to make it usable. Next, please. And then finally, we have a Royal Society meeting upcoming um, on essential geodiversity variables early next year. If you're interested in joining that, please feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. So interesting uh, to discover new aspects of the essential variables. Let's uh, move into the agriculture uh, sector. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, Sven Gilliams here. He already has a background in agricultural engineering, but uh, he works now more on remote sensing uh, for the last 20 years. And from Vito, uh, he is the uh, he is the remote sensing applying group. Uh, manager. He's currently also leading the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Security Showcase in ESHAPE and uh, the ESA uh, World Cereal Project. And uh, he is an active member of the GeoGlam. That's the last word in your title. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present a bit of work if uh, GeoGlam in uh, essential uh, cultural variables. So now going from below ground back up ground, but uh, there's there's definitely an interaction between what was presented by Francisca earlier at the soil. Uh, soil is really important for agriculture. And I think that's that's already giving away a bit my the key message I have in my presentation that uh, between all these EAVs, there's quite a lot of interaction. And so there needs a, a bit more uh, coordination there because I think there's a chance of the, us duplicating stuff. I think Anthony already mentioned FAPAR, NDVI, uh, LA, LAI in his uh, presentation. Those are also typically uh, indicators that in the agricultural domain are really important. So, but okay, um, EAV work in, in GeoGlam. So where did we start? Yeah, it, uh, well, basically for us, it was also a, a, a way to communicate uh, with, a, with the complexity or to deal with the complexity of the policy landscape. So it's clear that the information that we are developing in GeoGlam can support a multitude of policy targets, but it's also clear that um, there's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You're also, you always need uh, information also coming from other science communities. And so we definitely came, well, 
quickly came to a vision that we need an, a common approach across different communities to integrate and share the information that, that, we're, that we're developing. But for that, leadership is required uh, to get the integrated approach and also um, it needs to be that that leadership needs to be authoritative across the multiple um, communities. Um, and that's in fact already my takeaway message. It's always good to put it in your first slide. That's what I learned from uh, uh, the people at GRC. Um, next slide, please. So how do we tackle uh, EAVs within um, uh, the GeoGlam? I think the most important part, because the left left part of the of, of the slide you can you can um, you can always uh, read. The the most important one is the, is that right side of the slide, the, the the pyramid, where we try to to give a bit the flow of where we see the interactions, where we see uh, everything coming together. So we start at the bottom where you have data and observations, and I think the remark that was made by Francisco on, on in situ also goes for, uh, for agriculture. Um, in World Serial, we're now working on the first global crop type maps. Well, getting in situ over crop types at global scale, it's, it's, it's not that easy as people might think. So from the data, those flow into the essential agricultural variables where we see the interaction with the other communities on the EVs, but it's not a one direction flow, it's also circular flow because the EAVs will also define gaps in data and, uh, and observations. From that, we go into the core products. We're still in debate if we need that differentiation, but let's, let's have it for now. So core information products flow into knowledge and knowledge will flow into sustainable decisions at policy level. Um, next slide, please. So what's the importance of the essential agricultural variables to us. So they're really fundamental in driving our data needs. So in, in situ data, but also new, new data. Um, they're driving our observation needs, um, but also the level of ARD and ARD plus. Um, and they drive our R&D priorities. Um, so that's really, really, really key. And as explained already, EAVs can really help address many policy drivers, but also um, we need integration across different uh, science policies. Um, next slide. So where are we at? Um, there's a GeoGlam working group on EAVs, so on essential agricultural variables. Um, we had a couple of in-person when we we're still allowed. So you can guess how long we're working on those ones already. So it's almost a year ago since we've seen everybody in person. So in person meetings, but also some virtual meetings to discuss each variable. So um, we had a, we have a whole list of what we call essential agricultural variables. Um, also there we see overlap with other communities. So we're also in that list, we're trying to link with other communities. If definitions in other communities are good or better than what we can come up, we use those. If there's an extra need for making it an agricultural essential variable, we keep it as a, we keep our own definitions. We're still building quite a lot of consensus because it's, it's not an easy task. Um, and at the moment we have draft pages per EAV, um, um, well, almost available. On the right hand side, you see a, an, uh, an example for the agricultural mask where you have the definition um, different requirements, how they're interlinked with other EAVs, um, etc. Um, but that's a work in, uh, in progress. So, and finally, I think we look forward to work together with the other geo communities on EVs. Um, some, some possible ways is, is, or some a possible way to start working together is, is um, maybe a demonstration project. Um, identify a policy driver that requires integration between different domain, um, get the communities uh, together. And then I think the last one is also maybe try to get some funding and, and, and proceed with this, with this work on an on a integrated way. And with that, that was my last slide. Thank you very much.
I mean, uh, George Huffman talking about essential water variables. Yeah, exactly. So uh, from soil to um, from soil to agriculture and from agriculture to water. Uh, so uh, you are a uh, research uh, physical scientist at the NASA Goddard Space uh, Flight uh, Center. Uh, you are a passionate on, on precipitation from my, what I can read, uh, because you want to incorporate all of all data about precipitation from satellites, from surface, from everywhere into a single data set. And, uh, and now you, you are the chief uh, of a lab that is called Mesosphere Atmospheric Process Lab. So please go ahead. Okay, so I think I show the go to the next slide. Uh, whoa, <laughs> it's a little bit dark, uh, but still readable, I hope. Okay, um, so I have co authors of uh, Sushil Anadair, who is on the call and has done a lot of the work, uh, uh, Angelica Gutierrez, which is who is uh, uh, the head of GeoGlows. And Rick Lawford, who has done yeoman labor for a lot of years, probably in some of your communities as well. Okay, next slide. Wow, they're all like this. I'm in trouble. Okay, um, here we go. So I wanted to give a little history, ah, pop, a little history about uh, where how we got here. And that is that back. Now, 15 years ago, there was the initial research on closing the global water budget. And we saw that certain variables were essential to get all of the components of the global water budget. Um, they had different levels of maturity, which was a real problem when we did the research. And uh, the variables came from and are needed by many different communities. And my suspicion is that the, at least two of the essential variable groups we've already heard from have water as some of their variables. Uh, next. Um, so what we did was, this is a, actually before my time with this group, is there was in 2010, a water needs societal benefits areas report. Remember that societal benefit areas and, uh, every variable, what I can report, I'm summarizing about 10 pages of fine print of tables that every variable has needs for different communities that range from short and local to climatological and global, um, it, it didn't bound the problem. And we, we are still discussing how we can make the best progress with making the most people happy. Uh, then in 2014, there was a GEOS water strategy report uh, edited by Rick Offord and really reported on the status in, in fair amount of detail about the different variables. Um, and once again, it, you know, it, it is impossible to escape noticing that some of the variables are in, in sort of rugged shape and some are not in such bad shape. Since then, additional discussions uh, have brought in water quality and surface water uh, extent and volume as additional variables in the EWVs. Probably, you know, five years ago, we thought we sort of had the list and then um, Geo suggested that, that these additional uh, items should come in. And uh, we, we have partnered with uh, uh, Geo Water to, to make that happen. Right now, Rick Offord is leading a status update on the water strategy report, which is already five years old, six years old, and uh, you know what, how we're doing. Okay, next. So it turns out that, that water just touches every amazing range of these international uh, things that we all care about. The key organizations I'll point out are the Integrated Global Water Cycle Observations, IGWCO, Community of Practice. That's been around for a long time and it was founded for, as it says, the, the global water cycle. In addition, there's the uh, GeoGlows, Geo Global Water Sustainability, which now it's sort of a shepherding IGWCO and, and uh, the water variables in general. And AquaWatch, who has joined with us to get these uh, 
water quality and other, uh, you know, sort of more qualitative things. Right now, the list of EWVs is pretty late in its revision, but it's still, you know, open for discussion. I think this will always be a living data set. The goal here is not to name as essential the things we can measure. The thing is to name as essential the things that we need and then figure out how to measure it if we're not able to do it yet. So we uh, seek endorsement and use from the communities at large across GEO and uh, welcome your support. Uh, next. So <laughs> my eye test, uh, there, is, there is a, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there we go. Um, the, the cells that look unoccupied actually have lots and lots of little X's in them that were maybe the wrong color. Um, and so when, when we hand out the slides, you'll be able to see this correctly. But imagine that essentially every box in that grid is filled in. All of these different international things depend on the various essential water variables to, ah, there we go. Uh, you'll notice that health probably depends on the fewest, but even there, there's a number of X's. And so we think um, we're on the right track with what these variables ought to be. The first two columns show you how we can sense these both remotely and in situ. Uh, what I can tell you as a data provider, even though I'm tagged as a, as a satellite guy, we desperately need all of it. We need in situ as badly as we need the remote sensing. And Anytime I have a chance, I say, if you have access to in situ data that's, in my case, water data, that's not getting into the system, we need it. Okay, so these are the essential water variables, but it turns out when we thought about it on the next page, there are also uh, supplementary, what we call supplementary essential water variables, things that we really need to know in order to do a good job getting what we have to know and in particular, something that's recent um, is on the next to last row, bathymetry. Um, if you know water extent and you know the contour of the Earth's surface under the water, then you can get volume. And so uh, that's, that's very powerful in terms of uh, uh, available water. So I suspect some of these are um, on other people's lists as well, maybe as your primaries. And so one of the things I would suggest here is that in the whole EV uh, constellation, uh, we probably only need to do bathymetry once. And water guys don't need to do it. The, the land surface people ought to do it. But we need to know what they're doing for us or to us. And that's my presentation. I think the next one is just a list of references. Early on, I was showing you various things. And this is how you actually get to all those things, plus a few extra. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You passed your eye test uh, proficiently. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is what happens when you mix several presentations all together. Uh, okay, next presentation is about health. Uh, John uh, Haynes uh, is uh serves as a uh, program manager for the health and air quality applications uh, in the applied science program of uh, the nasa earth science division and uh, he is also uh, the co-chair of the geo earth observations for health initiative and the geo health community of practice so please floor is yours Oh, th thank you so much, and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to speak here with you today from the health side of the coin. I would be remiss, though, not to mention my co-chair uh, for both the Earth Observations for Health Initiative and the Geo Health Community of Practice is Julie Tertan of NOAA in the United States and our executive coordinator, Helena Chapman of NASA. Without them, uh, it would not be the success that it is. So today, I just wanted in my, in my few minutes here just to give a bit of an overview of the geo health community of practice, what it is, how the Earth Observations for Health Initiative fits in, and what are some of the critical observations that we are utilizing in, in the community and in specific projects. Uh, the Geo Health Community of Practice serves as an umbrella organization, bringing together all the pieces of the Geo Work Program that have some intersection with health. 
Now, of course, the largest facet of that is the Earth Observations for Health initiative, but many other aspects of the work program have a health intersection, things like Geobine, uh, Blue Planet, Aqua Watch, because as we in the health community, uh, we, we utilize the paradigm of One Health, that we must take a holistic view of environmental, animal, and human health because they are all directly inter interrelated. So the GeoHealth Community of Practice serves as this global network of governments, organizations, and observers who seek to use Earth observation data to improve health decision making at international, regional, country, and district levels. And I also wanted to say that you don't have to be a member of GEO. You can be geocurious, if you will, to join the health community of practice. So we always encourage new members to come in from outside of GEO, and hopefully they will become involved with GEO at that point. Uh, we have been, since the beginning of the global pandemic in March 2020, holding weekly and now bi-weekly teleconferences of the health community, uh, while also speaking regularly at a wide variety of workshops and symposium, including here, of course, at the Geo Virtual Symposium, also coming up at the AmeriGeo Week for the Americas in August, where health is one of the priority focus areas of AmeriGeo. And also every year we have our annual uh, kind of uh, plenary meeting in conjunction with the American Geophysical Union's fall meeting in December. So if we can go to the next slide, I do want to invite again everybody and perhaps uh, have even a presentation from GeoEssential at one of our upcoming teleconferences. We are calling them our COVID-19 teleconferences, but not every teleconference is focused exclusively on COVID-19. We are bringing in uh, experts from across the globe to discuss many other issues that are critical to the health and air quality community because while of course COVID-19 is our biggest community challenge and the biggest global challenge right now, the other challenges have not disappear. And so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, so our next teleconference is June 29th uh, at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time in the United States. That's GMT minus four. Again, please visit our website at geohealthcop.org. Not only can you see information about the some of the projects I'm going to talk about today, but also information and presentations from our previous telecons, as well as the agenda for future ones as well. It's really a great resource. So let's go to the next slide. Also, um, I'd like to mention that our community of practice has self-organized into small working groups around critical issues of the health and air quality community. And these small working groups are looking to address gaps in knowledge of, among these uh, topic area, topical areas, as well as looking for opportunities of how to uh, have GEO respond to these issues and potentially inform future GEO work programs. That includes a heat-related health risk uh, work group, an infectious disease one, an air quality, wildfires, and respiratory health group, a food security and safety group, as well as a healthcare infrastructure group. So let's go to the next slide. So certainly, and we're talking about not only remote, remotely sensed from our satellite constellation, but also in situ that there are a variety of, of earth observations and many are critical for health and air quality applications. These are just a few of them, like land temperature, sea surface temperature, vegetation density, precipitation, fire and thermal anomalies, aerosols. And of course, thanks to the yeoman efforts of GEO over the past two decades, many of these data sets are now free and open access to uh, researchers and application end users across the globe. Uh, for example, all of NASA's uh, Earth observation data from our Earth, um, our, our satellite constellation of 20 plus satellites is all free and open access to the world at earthdata.nasa.gov. So this provides a, a great resource for the globe and being able to harness these environmental observations when looking at the issues that are related to health and air quality. Let's go to the next slide. So in the Geo Earth Observation for Health initiative, we currently have five active projects that are working in connecting earth and environmental observations to health issues. I'm only gonna talk about a couple of them. Uh, again, on our website, you could see much more information on the other projects. One of them is looking at environmental determinants of gastrointestinal diseases. And this is led by Dr. Benzman Zajcek of Johns Hopkins University. And Dr. Zajcek for the past couple of years has been utilizing satellite observations of temperature, soil moisture and precipitation to understand global rates of gastrointestinal illnesses. Uh, this is in collaboration with a large global cohort health study. And of course, you have to have other information beyond environmental when you're looking at these issues, such as socioeconomic information, demographic information, of course, infection data. 
Uh, once the global pandemic began and was declared in March 2020, Dr. Zajcik was uh, further augmented in his project to study how similar data could be used to investigate potential environmental factors that may influence COVID-19 transmission. And that work is continuing, of course, to this day. It has been uh, tremendously helpful that he has been able to leverage the health community of practice of GEO by bringing in many other partners across the globe to help utilize their data sets and their information to help study this issue of COVID-19's potential seasonality. Let's go to the next slide. Also, I'd like to mention that one of the silver linings in this terrible year and a half that the globe has faced during this pandemic is a, a sterling example of international collaboration that emerged between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency. And this was the COVID-19 Earth Observation Dashboard that you can visit at the website at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this dashboard uh, is open access, free to the public, and researchers across the globe and provides a wide variety of economic, agricultural, air and water indicators to not only help understand and inform how environmental indicators may affect the spread and transmission of COVID-19, but also how our human behaviors during this pandemic have impacted the earth system. The, the dashboard also includes COVID-19 health uh, infection data and, and case data, death data as well. So people can use different layers to look at different intersections of these environmental indicators in COVID-19 cases. Let's go to the next slide. Also uh, mention another project that's very important when you're talking about vector-borne diseases. It's a project developing a malaria early warning system for Myanmar in Asia, led by Dr. Tatiana Loboda of the University of Maryland in the United States. Dr. Loboda has worked over the past several years to develop this early warning system for Myanmar in collaboration with the Ministry of Health in that country and Duke Global Health, using a wide variety of observations. Of course, the environmental variables are very important, such as surface temperature, vegetation stress, and surface water, but you have to also bring in the data sets for exposure and vulnerability if you're going to truly have an accurate model of uh, risk characterization for malaria, and that includes population distribution, occupational exposure, social vulnerability, access to care. That all has to go into determining what the malaria burden potential is, not only in Myanmar, but also in similar studies in other countries across the globe. Um, I, I will say that this has been a very successful project, unfortunately, due to the political situation currently in the nation of Myanmar, uh, its full implementation is on hold, uh, but the uh, results uh, it previously were, were very accurate in determining risks in different regions of Myanmar for malaria, depending on environmental and other conditions. And we can go to the next slide, and that's all I'm going to say there. Again, you are all welcome to please come and join us in the GeoHealth Community Practice. We welcome presentations. Uh, for more information, please visit our website or reach out directly to either myself, Julie, or Helena Chapman. Uh, thank you again so much. Yes, thank you for that. And uh, as promised, we open a little bit of a view, and uh, we uh, now are told about the digital platform uh, for SDGs and uh, ADBs. Uh, Hiromichi Fukui uh, is a professor in the Kubo University and director of the International Digital Earth Applied Science Research Center on Kubo Institute of Advanced uh, Studies. And uh, he uh, is uh, also he, he also serves as a as director of the International Society for Digital Earth and the Center for Environmental Information Science, among others. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the brief introduction and uh, thank you for giving me a chance to make a presentation. So next slide, please. Oof. Again, uh, again, again, problems with colors. Please yeah. go ahead and let's see what I can do. Yes, I have a collaboration with the JAXA on long years, for example, the Sentinel Asia project for the disaster management project. So next slide, please. Yeah, sure. As you know that uh, we are focusing on the digital arts approach. Uh, it is uh, introduced by ex-Vice President Al Gore, United States in 1998. It is a multi-resolution, three-dimensional representation of a planet. 
And it is very important for the collaboratory for not only research scientists, but for the citizen scientists. Next slide, please. So ideas, that is the abbreviation of uh, International Digital Arts Applied Science Research Centers. Uh, that is uh, one of the joint usage and research center by the Ministry of Education and uh, Science and Technologies. We're focusing on the uh, first phase to how to build a digital arts and what is uh, technological element. And now we are phase two to the emerging complex system problem, for example, of the mitigation and adaptation to the global warming issues and also resilient and sustainable city, and also consensus and decision making about uh, nuclear and the renewable energy issues. We are dealing with such kind of uh, research topics in a multi resolution platform of data loss. Next, please. So we focusing on the monitoring of uh, sustainable development goal. So we are now promoting to make uh, essential SDGs variable. That is uh, how defined that uh, SDGs variable. We are following that uh, example of uh, Prague and Jerry Prague papers. That is a goal-based approach, uh, linkage between the SDGs and the essential transformation variable. We're also following a lot of uh, practice for other field, biodiversity variable, water, and ocean, and climate, and so on. And recently, uh, we're focusing on SDGs indicator mapping in Japan from the viewpoint of uh, human security issues. These resources is integrated to proposed of uh, essential sustainable development goal variable. So uh, generally speaking, we are using a whole layer model, uh, which it is uh, in inner circle is uh, one of the domain of the field of uh, sustainable development goal, like uh, people and uh, social ethical aspect and also governance and the policy development and the infrastructure and built environment and economies and also as life supporting systems. Each layer is uh, dividing of uh, essential variable categories. For example, in uh, people and social ethical aspect, we uh, categorize, of, uh, for example, life, health, economy, education, welfare, and lifestyle, and the dignity and the trust of the public sectors. So uh, we divided uh, these kind of uh, categories. And then we are choosing that uh, essential sustainable development goal variables. For example, in the field of uh, people and Society, social and ethical aspect, we are proposing about 90, 19 ESDG variable. And at this moment, totally, we're proposing about 69 ESDG variable. And next slide, please. So we have uh, this kind of uh, table. It's a long table that uh, consists of a uh, whole layer model is one is uh, essential variable layers and essential variable category and essential SDG variable and essential variable product that is corresponding to the uh, indicators. We also discussing of uh, resolution of uh, spatial and also uh, time resolution that. And also discussing about uh, earth observation contribution and also belonging to the uh, another essential variable categories. So next slide, please. 
So we're discussing also relationship of existing essential variables and uh, our essential SDGs variable. So we're following that uh, Anthony's pictures. We have uh, these kind of structure is supporting to the uh, SDGs variable. So next slide, please. So this is the conceptual data flow of the DataLast platform. And as you know that uh, we are discussing about uh, UN, GGIM, they are proposing over these kind of structures, uh, goal, target, and the indicators. Mo we are focusing on the how to mapping the indicators. In that case, it is uh, useful to employing that uh, essential variable concept. So now we propose it uh, 69 essential variable or SDGs that is coming from, of course, our observation data set and also special infrastructure data and the statistics like a census and also big data, other data resources, crowd sourcing and the citizen sciences data. That is uh, general flow of the data as platform. So please next. We also making a platform of the SDGs variable monitoring and uh, visualizing system by using a digital as platform. It is architecture of a digital as SDGs platform. So there is a whole layer model is uh, Bottom layer is the resource layer and uh, data management layer and server service layers and also client layers. And we are also focusing on the interoperability and the interconnectivities of uh, global digital ecosystems like uh, uh, left hand side chart. So Interoperability is one of the key issues to making such kind of uh, platform. So please, next, please. This is one of the demonstration of the visualization. Uh, uh, left hand up uh, visualization is that we are choosing of uh, functionalities and also we visualize each of the data and also overlays and uh, even in uh, analysis services, also adding in the futures. So this is uh, one of the prototype of SDGs. And next slide, please. Uh, so that is uh, one of the conclusion. At this moment, uh, we are proposing an initial set of uh, ESDGs variable that is composed of uh, 69 variable. And we are providing Team digital arts or SDGs. Now we're developing an operation in Japan and possible to the expanding to the Asia region and also globally. So that all. Thank you very much. This is a reference that I'm using. You are familiar with that kind of references. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Now we have uh, uh, Simon Eggleston to, to actually do a small discussion that is going to be very small, uh, definitely. So uh, he is the senior scientific officer in the global climate observing uh, system. He supports the terrestrial observation panel for uh, the, the climate that defines essential climate variables. So I, I don't know how to do this, but in the six minutes we have, maybe you could tell us being one of the you know, starting points of, of all of these, uh, the essential climate variables, how do you see the, the extensibility of the concept to, to other sectors that are going beyond climate, uh, even beyond physical, uh, measurements and uh, going to human 
effects like health and, and, and all this and so we could have a small discussion about that if you want. Yeah, thanks. It's been very interesting listening to the, the presentations. Um, yeah, I mean, with this, the idea of essential variables and essential climate variables coming from GCOS, um, we have taken actually a lot of the things people have talked about across the different presentations, to some extent, are ECVs, they are climate variables as well. Um, obviously, hydrology and the water cycle is a key component of understanding the climate. And it's interesting to see how these are being taken up for other uses. I saw there was a um, question from Terry Sawyer in the chat about the uh, overlaps and duplications between the ECVs and other ECVs, other EVs. Um, and I think that is a question that sticks in my mind about this, is how do, how, how is this overlap between the ECVs dealt with? In the climate world, we're now looking at not just things of a sort of climatological basis, but actually quite short time intervals, because obviously the impacts of climate change often are st strongly associated with uh, extreme events. Uh, so again, in hydrology, flooding, extreme precipitation and so forth. Um, and one of the concerns we've heard from certainly observing organizations like the WMO um, is that they really want to get uh, here one set of requirements. They don't want to have a whole string of different requirements for the same sort of observation. So I, I think that would be one question that I would have is how do how do you organize across these essential variables so there isn't too much overlap or contradiction between them. I think another thing that did strike me listening to all of this was, um, you know, how, how much further can it, can the idea go? Uh, we seem to be covering a large part of society now. And uh, is this enough? Or are there other areas that need the same sort of variables? So having said that, I was wondering, well, first of all, I think I'd like to ask the presenters if they've got any comments on those two themes. Yeah, George Huffman. Um... I, the point is well taken from the administrative side that one set of requirements is enough. Um, and my observation is that if you want coarse scale variables, you can average those from the fine scale variables. But it is not possible to average, get the fine scale variables from the coarse scale variables. And so as we define these things, what, what we found in our group is that you head toward the finest scales that you can support. And then when people want coarser scales, you give them coarser scales. Now, we, my thumb is on the scale because in fact, in our precipitation work, we most trust the monthly products we create because it, some of the, the nasty random stuff has averaged out. But in principle, you know, it's up to me to figure out how to get the best possible fine scales out of the data I've got. And then if you want something coarser, in fact, my fine scales by definition add up to the to the monthly. So the monthly you get is the thing that we trust the most. And so I, I would put forward that we need to be figuring out how to get fine legitimate fine scale stuff that supports that community. And then that provides the basis for getting the coarser scales. The problem with that in general is fine scale tends to be a shorter time period. The coarse scales frequently go use data sets that go further back in time. I understand that. So we're not done. No, we certainly aren't. Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone else got any thoughts? Yeah, I raised my hand. I don't know if you... Um, yeah, my understanding by running this geocentral project was that uh, obviously from last year, there was already a lot of new things coming out on essential variables and we Nobody can really direct it, it's happening. And uh, even though I would have loved that uh, somehow the essential climate variables were 
covering everything so that the story was uh, finished. It's not the case and you cannot really stop other communities to think the same way you did. And uh, my concern is that at least within GEO, we managed to push forward for the different so-called SBAs, uh, the set of essential variables, not only on the earth system sites, but also on these uh, socioeconomical activities like agriculture or health and so on. And indeed it is, it's improving. And I guess our GEO EVs uh, community would like to promote uh, this uh, spreading of this great idea of, of essential variables across that and, and as it was, I think, demonstrated by uh, um, uh, the last presentation, uh, it, it would help us address this more complex issue of SDGs and so on and so forth. Yeah, not, and not only address, uh, but also to, to assess the overlap. So that's why the community activity is important to find these this possible overlaps and, and look for solutions for, for that. It's uh, 7.30. I don't know if we are going to be, you know, removed from this room, but uh, that doesn't mean we can try to discuss a little bit more and see what happens. So, <laughs> Francisca, please. I'll, I'll just start talking if I stop in the middle, then that's, you know, why. Um, so I, I still think there's value in having some overlap because we come at essential variables from different disciplines, even if we if, if we call it the same thing. So for example, with the bathymetry, that's something that we have also looked at within the EGBs and um, we heard that it's also of interest to the water um, variables, but for different reasons. And I think um, somebody mentioned it in the in the chat that one, one factor is um, the resolutions and the different kind of uh, temporal and spatial um, aspects that we need to, to keep in mind, depending what we want to use it for. But also I think that just uh, having the expertise there helps because maybe if, if you ask a, a geologist about um, developing EGVs and measuring um, geology, they will come up with different data that they say is important and they understand the data better, like um, with the climate data that you know you trust the monthly data more than, than the, maybe the daily or hourly data. So um, yeah, I just, I, I think that there's, there's value in having different disciplines looking at similar um, variables. Yeah, yes, I, I think that's very true. And I, I think, I suppose what I'm really getting at is though that there needs to be some communication between the, the different disciplines when they're looking at a similar variable. Um, oh, definitely, yeah. The case mm -hmm. the I think and there has been a lot of overlap um, in, in efforts as well, which is, I mean, we, we are restricted in terms of um, financial and people power. So it's, it's a shame if we duplicate efforts unnecessarily. Yeah. Sven? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's absolutely, absolutely true. And I, there is value in, in, in different communities looking at the same indicators. What we've been doing with their culture, because I think what um, the CECOS uh, essential global variables is something that we're definitely looking at. And we're actually looking at those definitions, how they're used and how they can be used within the agricultural community. And we only say, okay, we, we take extra measurements or we adapt those things if they're not directly applicable within our own domain. If they are, fine. We're not going to define precipitation in agriculture differently than, than, than in another community because we can implement it in the same way in agriculture. So I think that's, 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 and I think this is really crucial within this group, looking at all the definitions that we are using, which variables we are using, how they're used, and then communicate between each other how they're used so that there's only duplication where duplication is needed. Let's put it like that. There is this question in the chat about the essential health variables and if there, there are discussions happening on about it. About the definition of those essential variables for health. You know, that, that is not a term that has been, at least in our community of practice, brought up, but I think it's a very important, you know, that's why I was saying having having 
results from GeoEssential and having that discussion being brought into the community practice, maybe a presentation on it, because we're certainly discussing, uh, you know, we may be calling it different names, but what's, it's the same thing that we're talking about. When we're talking about essential variables, not only environmental variables that must be brought into play into our activities, but also <clears throat> um, other types of, of human variables. So we're talking about infection data, you're talking about population data, we're talking about socioeconomic data. Uh, we're talking about migration data. All of these are, are essential in order to be able to develop any type of accurate risk characterization models for a variety of health threats. Um, one of the examples we kind of give on that is when you're looking at malaria models, uh, if you don't bring in socioeconomic factors into a malaria risk characterization model, it's not going to be accurate at all because if you just rely on environmental variables, it would show that the southeastern United States is a malaria hotspot. Well, it was prior to air conditioning being developed in the 1950s and people closing their windows. That, that, of course, disrupts the mosquito's ability to travel from house to house and transmit malaria. So socioeconomic reasons come into play just as heavily as environmental reasons when you're talking about spread of many vector-borne diseases. So while we haven't in, in the, the community use that exact term, it is, it is the same as what you were talking about. There's a question from Kerry again in the, in the chat about the danger of diluting the importance of what are truly considered essential. If each community has 30 plus variables that are considered essential, and there are 20 communities with EVs, how are organizations and institutions to prioritize and to respond to requests for data? I think this is a, is a good point in a way, because we, even within GCOPS, we've had criticism that we have too many climate variables alone. So, how would you respond to that? <laughs> I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem as well, right? So before we have the data, maybe we can't say if it's important, but we need to invest in getting the data first. So uh, yeah, at least in, in, in my community, we, we have that issue and we are looking at um, a lot of groups are working on, on um, finding out which ones are essential, as I said in, in my presentation, that's one of the challenges we have. And I think um, the more finer scale, higher resolution data we have, maybe the more um, we, we change what we see as essential or not. It's, I think it's a dynamic thing as well. It's definitely a challenge. And I agree that essential variables lose their value a bit if, if we have too many of them. Yeah, there's a comment from Stephen in the chat. I thought GeoHuman Planet was already working on essential socioeconomic variables. I don't know if anyone knows anything about that. No, that's well, probably a useful link for you to explore. I've I've just found it. I'll I'll share the link. Thanks. essential societal variables. Okay. Has anyone got anything else they'd like to raise? An umbrella. <laughs> Have you looked out the window? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you can hear the thunder or not, but uh, it's raining here. Yeah, well, I will not do any jokes in presence of all of all these precipitation experts that that, that, that are around here. <laughs> uh, I, I just have a point that I hope that uh, this discussion we had last year and this new one and possibly uh, next ones in other geo meetings will. will will continue because I, I feel there is a common interest in understanding what others are doing and avoiding duplications, of course, but uh, uh, also allowing each community to, to identify what is essential to monitor and, and uh, for its own purpose, and also to be able to then integrate across for SDGs and other integrated uh, systems. 
So, I, Anthony, I'm uh, I, maybe Kerry remembers, but I asked the very question at the program board meeting in Ispra about what was the strategy for essential variables because I I heard about water, about agriculture, you know, and obviously I knew about climate and other ones. So I'm going to check what the outcome was from that session because I'm not sure it was fully addressed. Um, someone tried to answer it and I think it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up. So it's obviously a, a bigger or more important issue than I think the way it's been handled. In, in my personal opinion, not speaking as PB or anything. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Okay. So and that and with that maybe we could conclude the the session with the hope that uh, we will continue discussing that uh, uh, in the program board as well as in the community activity that uh, we will continue pushing. Thank you very much, everybody. It has been it has been very informative uh, and uh, also very stimulating. Yes. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye.